Hey there guys, Paul here from TheEngineeringMindset.com. In this video, we're going to be looking at electronic component cooling to understand why this is critical to the design of electronic circuit boards. We'll look at the different options available, as well as how to simulate and virtually test the performance of cooling systems using computational fluid dynamics. All of our electrical devices are built by combining different electronic components together. Each component has a specific function. Take this very simple lighting circuit for example. The battery provides electrical energy. The LED produces light from the energy supplied by the battery. And the resistor protects the LED by reducing the current in the circuit. If we remove the resistor, the LED will instantly burn out. So why does the LED burn out? Because the resistance of the circuit is reduced, meaning it becomes much easier for more electrons to flow from the battery and through the LED component. As you can see, the internal components of the LED are tiny, and I don't mean these parts, I mean these parts, which you can only see with a very good lens. These parts can only cope with a certain amount of electrons flowing through them, otherwise they will just burn out. On the other hand, an electrical cable is much thicker, so it can handle far more current flowing through it. That's why we have different size cables, to handle different amounts of current. Coming back to the resistor, this is essentially just adding a restriction to the flow of electrons. It's like having a kink in a water pipe. The kink restricts how much water can flow through the pipe. So it wastes energy, and it will result in a pressure drop. As we know, pressure is like voltage, and the resistor is like the kink in the pipe. So, when we add a resistor to the circuit, we restrict the current, or the amount of electrons flowing, and we get a voltage drop. Why do we get a voltage drop? Well, if we look at a normal copper wire, this is made from millions and millions and millions of copper atoms. Copper is a conductor, which means the copper atoms have an electron which is free to move around between other atoms. They do naturally just move to other atoms, but randomly and in all directions. If we apply a voltage difference across the wire, the voltage or pressure of the battery will force electrons to flow through it. But with a resistor, the material is less conductive and creates a harder path for the electrons to flow through. The electrons are going to collide, and as they collide, their energy is converted into heat. So the energy of the battery is really being wasted and turned into heat. Because the energy of the battery is being removed by the resistor, we get a voltage drop. That's why when we look at a resistor through a thermal imaging camera, we can see it is generating heat. Some components, such as MOSFETs and IGBTs, will produce huge amounts of heat. Take this cheap bench power supply for example. It has four MOSFETs inside. Two here, and two here. If I remove the heatsink, and we'll look at that part a little later in this video, and then I power a small DC circuit with around 1.2 amps of current, we can see with the thermal imaging camera that these components very quickly reach 45 degrees Celsius. I cut the power at this point because I didn't want to damage the components. All electronic components have a thermal limit, or a maximum operating temperature. When they reach or exceed this certain temperature, they will break down and potentially destroy the circuit board. For some components like a fuse, this is desirable because the material breaks and this instantly cuts the power to the circuit. This helps to prevent component damage, but it also completely stops the circuit board from working until the fuse is replaced. With components like an IGBT, the buildup of heat isn't a good thing, because as they increase in temperature, they become unreliable, and the current passing through them increases. This additional current creates heat, which in turn allows more current to flow, and so the component reaches a thermal runaway, and will eventually just destroy itself. So, to increase the lifespan of the component and the circuit board, as well as to keep the components operating in a stable, reliable condition, we need a way to remove the thermal energy which the component generates. So how do we remove the thermal energy of the electronic components? Some components, such as this simple resistor LED circuit, will operate fine in normal ambient conditions. They do not produce much heat and do not need any additional cooling. The heat they do produce will dissipate into the ambient air. But when the heat starts to increase in larger circuits, we can use a simple fan to blow air across the component. The moving air will pick up and carry the heat away. This is the method used on PCs, 
and that's why there's a fan inside to literally remove the heat from the internal components. However, there is a problem with this method. We're blowing the heat off of one component and this hot air then passes across other components. So while we are cooling down one component, if we're not careful with the design, we're going to heat other components up. This simulation was run in a browser using SimScale, and we're going to look at that in detail a little later in this video. We usually need a more effective way to get the heat out of the actual component, and a popular method is to use a heatsink to provide passive cooling. This heatsink is usually made from aluminium or aluminum. These heatsinks have multiple fins on them. The fins help to increase the surface area of the component to allow maximum exposure to more ambient air. The heatsink is made from a metal because this conducts heat well, much better than the air. So by making it easier for more heat to escape and increasing the exposure to the air, we effectively cool down the component. There is a limit to how much we can remove with this method though. And so the next stage is to use a fan to blow ambient air over the component and heatsink. That's exactly the method used in this DC bench power supply. The fan and the heatsink are combined to remove the excess heat. You can see the heat is dissipating out through the heatsink, and when I cut the power but leave the fan running, the temperature drops very quickly. Another method that's most commonly used in laptops is to use a heat pipe. That's this strange bar you'll see inside your laptop running between the processor and the fan. Inside this is a small amount of liquid and a wick. The heat of the processor is transferred into the pipe, and this heat will cause the liquid inside to boil and evaporate. The vapor moves towards the opposite end, which is cooler, because the fan is blowing ambient air across the surface of the heat pipe, and this removes the excess heat. This removal of heat causes the vapor to condense back into a liquid, and this liquid flows back along the wick to pick up more heat, and so the cycle repeats. Again, these also have a performance limit. To increase the heat removal, we have to start using these larger and larger units, which obviously take up a lot of space, and again blow the heat over other components. The next stage for maximum cooling is to use water or liquid cooling. You may have seen that high-spec gaming computers have now started to use water cooling systems to remove heat from their CPU and GPU. We basically have a small pump which cycles water between the heat exchanger of the CPU, known as the water block, and the radiator, which is a heat exchanger with some fans. Again, the fans will blow air across the heat exchanger and remove the unwanted heat from the water. So the water picks up the unwanted heat from the chip and carries this over to the radiator and then flows through the heat exchanger of the radiator. The fans blow air across the outside of the heat exchanger, which removes the unwanted heat from the water within. The water therefore leaves cooler and returns to the chip to pick up more heat. The reason this method is so efficient is because water has a substantially higher heat capacity than air, which means it can pick up more heat. Additionally, rather than pushing air across the fins and blowing the heat across other components, the water-cooled system is collecting the heat and moving this away, and then rejecting it completely from the system. This method of cooling is increasingly used in power electronics, especially in higher power applications, where we often find these banks of IGBTs. These banks of IGBTs generate huge amounts of heat and need to operate reliably for long periods of time. As we saw in the bench power supply, the IGBTs or the MOSFETs were spaced out and take up a lot of room. So instead, what we can do is mount these to a thermal block, which is basically a heat sink or a heat exchanger The water flows through instead of air. As the IGBTs generate heat, this will pass through the block and into the water. Between the IGBTs and the thermal block, we have a thick layer of thermal paste, which helps to increase the heat transfer. Inside the block, we have these fins to help increase the surface area of the heat exchanger and maximize the exposure to the cooling water, which is removing the unwanted heat. Let's say for this example, we want to ensure that these particular IGBTs do not exceed 90 degrees Celsius. That's their maximum working temperature. To do that, we're going to simulate the performance utilizing the SimScale CAE platform who have kindly sponsored this video. SimScale provides instant access to online computational fluid dynamics as well as finite element analysis via a user-friendly cloud-based application available through a simple subscription model. No installation is required. You can try the software for free and edit public projects at simscale.com via their community account. 
or you can create private projects with enhanced features via their professional team or enterprise accounts. If you want to try this software out yourself, then I've included a link in the video description for you. So after we design our CAD model, we can import this into SimScale for analysis. We input our variables such as the materials being used, the thermal power emitted by the IGBTs, the water flow rate and the outlet pressure of the water, etc. From this initial analysis, we can see that the IGBTs are going to operate at around 165 degrees Celsius, which is far too high and will result in the destruction of the components and possibly our circuit board, so we need to make some changes. The first change we will make is to the materials. We will use aluminium for the heatsink because this has a very high thermal conductivity. This means heat can pass through it much easier. Between the IGBTs and the thermal block, we will also use thinner layer of thermal paste so that the IGBTs are closer to the heat transfer area, making it easier for the heat to reach the cooling liquid. So as you can see, these simple changes have made a dramatic effect. Our IGBTs are now down to around 49 degrees Celsius, which is perfect because it's below our thermal limit of 90 degrees and it also provides a good buffer before we would hit that limit. So now the next step is to improve the efficiency of our design. The original design has these fins running through the heat exchanger, which help to expose the water to the heat of the IGBTs. However, we can see that this design causes a high pressure drop in each channel. The pressure drop of each channel adds to the pressure drop of the next channel. So overall, the pressure drop across the unit is very large. So instead, we're going to use a pin style channel. And when we run the simulation for this design, we see a much more even pressure distribution across each of the channels and a lower pressure differential across the entire unit, leading to improved cooling performance and lower operating costs. So just by simulating the cooling system in SimScale and making simple design alterations, we can very quickly make drastic improvements to the performance of our cooling system and thus ensure that our expensive and critical electronic circuit boards are operating within their thermal limits. This maximizes reliability and lifespan, as well as reducing the operating costs. Okay guys, that's it for this video, but to continue your learning, then check out one of the videos on screen now, and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, as well as theengineeringmindset.com.